Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural Story Time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only Only in in the dark. dark. Southern Gothic. In 1987, I was living in a house in Atlanta with four roommates. We lived there for just over a year, and during that time, we had several experiences with what we later became convinced was an actual ghostly presence. The house we were renting was well over 100 years old, having been built sometime just after the American Civil War, when Atlanta had been burned and destroyed by Union forces. The house was a beautiful old Victorian home located in an area of Atlanta known as Inman Park. We were all pretty young, in our 20s, and trying to get started in our respective careers, so the prospect of sharing the rent for a wonderful old two-story, five-bedroom house with a full basement was an attractive one. One week after moving in, we were all asleep in our room, when we were awakened by screaming from our roommate. Her name was Jana. We all jumped out of bed and went to Jana's room. She was sitting up, saying that she had woken up to see the dark figure of a man standing next to her bed, looking down at her. She said that when she had screamed, the figure turned and walked out of the room. She was very scared and highly agitated. Myself and the other male roommates. The housemates consisted of two male-female couples and one single female. Immediately checked out the inside and outside of the house, but we could find no intruder. This happened around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. We finally got Jana to calm down and everyone went back to bed. The next day, we just chalked up this first incident to nervousness about living in a new home that just happened to be a creaky and somewhat spooky old antique house. However, Jana would not hear of that explanation and in the ensuing days continued to insist that she had seen this dark figure standing by her bed. She refused to stay in the house alone after that. About two weeks after that first incident, we were all again sleeping when suddenly there was a very loud crash and the sound of tinkling glass from the hallway. This hallway separated all the bedrooms and a common bathroom. Once more, we all jumped up and ran out into the hall where we found that a full-length mirror that had been mounted on the bathroom door had shattered into hundreds of pieces all over the floor. Since everyone had been asleep, we could not figure out how this had happened as the mirror frame was still securely fastened to the door and only the glass itself had broken. Atlanta is not prone to earthquakes and the street was not a busy one. So we ruled out the possibility that a large truck or something had passed by and caused vibrations to occur inside the place. Later, similar poltergeist activity would manifest itself in many ways. There was one instance when I was home alone in the house watching television, when for no good reason that I could later ascertain, three candles that were sitting on the fireplace mantel suddenly fell off onto the floor, almost as if someone had swept them off with a hand. Then there was the phenomenon that we all experienced at one time or another, where personal objects and other items would go missing, only to turn up later in a place where the owner would swear that he or she had not left them. On one occasion, missing car keys were found lying right in the middle of the person's bed after a thorough search had been conducted for them by everyone home at the time. Other strange activity came in the form of knocking and tapping sounds heard coming from either the attic or the basement when it was certain that no one was in either space. The last incident that involved the sighting of an actual entity occurred about two months after we had moved in. We were having a small party at our place and a house guest who none of us had met prior to the party was taking a personal tour of the place on her own. She suddenly came running up from downstairs saying that she had just seen a man standing in the corner of the basement. She said that when she had called out to him, he simply disappeared. We immediately went down to the basement to check and of course found nobody. 
This was most interesting because there was only one entrance into the basement and a person who might have been trying to play a trick would not have been able to escape past anyone without being seen. As noted, that house guest who saw the figure in the basement was a brand new acquaintance whom we later determined had no prior knowledge that our place had any sort of unusual activity connected to it. After about six months of all this, things seemed to quiet down and no more ghost activity was noticed or reported by anyone. We began to convince ourselves that maybe, just maybe, we had all overreacted to some degree and perhaps we were all just being overly imaginative about the whole thing. Finally, toward the end of our time living in the house, my wife and I were at a restaurant one evening having a drink and dinner. We struck up a conversation with another couple sitting at a table nearby, two people who were complete strangers to us and whom we happened to meet that night by total chance. When they asked us where we were living in Atlanta, we told them about our place in Inman Park. They said, really? We used to live in Inman Park. Which street do you live on? And we told them, they said, that is interesting. We used to rent a house on that same street. What is your address? When we gave our address to them, they said, Oh my God, we used to rent that exact same house ourselves. Immediately followed by the woman saying, Have you seen the ghost yet? Well, you can imagine that both my wife and I were completely flabbergasted to receive such validation about our ghost problem from two complete strangers. We ended up comparing notes with them. They told us about many strange happenings they had witnessed in the house that were quite similar to our own. That experience thoroughly convinced me that there really is something to the whole subject of ghosts. And afterward, I no longer dismiss similar stories that I heard from other people quite so easily. Gothic Drive. When I was two years old, my family and I moved into a quaint little neighborhood in a small city outside of San Antonio, Texas, where I still live today. It's a quiet place with virtually no crime. Most of the people who live here are retired Air Force families from nearby Randolph Air Force Base. The streets in this neighborhood are named after ancient civilizations and important figures in ancient mythologies. One particular street was named Gothic Drive, after the Gothic tribes which ransacked Rome toward the end of the Great Empire's reign. As one would expect, this street was constructed in a way which mirrored the Goth's macabre reputation. Trees are planted so close together that sunlight is obscured and most of the street is blanketed in shadows, even in the middle of the day. The houses on that street, though small, are Victorian in design and are always dimly lit at night. Hedges and vines line the street, adding to the eeriness and mystique of the street. In spite of the dark aesthetics, I never felt uneasy or disturbed when I walked or drove through the street, until one night when a stranger appeared. The year was 2007. It was a clear moonlit summer night and I was driving home from a particularly bad date. The radio was tuned to my favorite station and my thoughts were geared heavily towards what had happened earlier that evening. As I turned onto Gothic Drive, the beams of my headlight struck something unusual at the other end of the street. Once I got close enough, I was able to make out the figure of a slender woman who was dressed in a black outfit of some sort. The closer I got, the more clear she became, and I realized that she was a nun. The sight of a nun in my neighborhood was unusual, but not so unusual that I paid much attention to it. I remember shrugging my shoulders and saying to myself, that's weird, and continuing on with my commute. Then something strange happened. When I looked back to catch another glimpse of her, I saw nothing. She had disappeared. I am a practical and skeptical person. So I initially wrote this incident off as a product of the situation that I was in that night. I figured that my heightened emotional state from the bad date had caused my mind to play tricks on me. Why my subconscious chose a nun as a manifestation of my frustration, I could not seem to figure out. Until I realized a few weeks later during a brisk midnight stroll that my explanation was dead wrong. It was later in the summer and I had decided to go out for a late night walk to alleviate some boredom and burn off some energy accumulated in the form of energy drinks. 
I know. It was stupid to drink those kind of drinks so late at night. Give me a break. These late night strolls were part of my nightly routine, thanks to the fact that my neighborhood is relatively safe and I am usually not the only one out and about that late. The neighborhood was quiet that night. Everyone seemed to be in bed, with the exception of one jogger and a few stray cats. And a raccoon. I hate those things. Anyway, I deviated from my usual route slightly and decided to walk through Gothic Drive, something I rarely did because it leads to the main road in my neighborhood, and I typically did not like to venture out that far. Tonight was different. I seemed to have been emotionally drawn in that direction. The houses on that street were unlit and the street lamp was off. I slowly made my way toward the end of the street. Suddenly the street lamp lit up brilliantly and there she was, standing in the rays of the lamplight. I was not afraid, not even close to being afraid. It was apparent that she wasn't an ordinary woman or even from this dimension. Her dress was black. Even the bright light from the lamp above her seemed to be absorbed by her dark ebony raiments. She appeared to float slightly above the ground and didn't seem to have any feet. For some reason, I could see her face quite clearly even though I was more than 20 feet away from her. She was a beautiful woman with dark eyes and soft red lips and she was smiling. I walked towards her shouting, howdy or something to that effect. The nun didn't move or speak. As I approached her, I blinked once. She vanished. I was in shock. Had I really seen a ghost? Was my imagination playing tricks on me? Then a terrible thought hit my mind. Was I hallucinating? Was I going nuts? My fears were relieved when I found out that I'm not the only one who has seen the nun. My brother told me he saw her one night while driving home from night classes at a local community college. Many of the neighbors I've talked to say that they've encountered her on different occasions. They told me that her facial expressions tend to reflect the moods of those who cross her path. If you're angry, she'll have an angry expression on her face. If you're happy, she'll smile and so on. The mystery of the ghostly nun fascinated me, but my focus soon shifted away from her when school started up again. I did not think much about her for several months after that. Then one night, I saw her again. This time, things were different. I had stormed out of the house after a vicious verbal exchange with my mother over something absolutely stupid and trivial. I had no intention of returning home until after my mom had gone to bed. So I decided to take a long walk, which meant going down the main road. To access that road, I turned onto Gothic Drive. I did not expect to see the mysterious nun, but sure enough, there she was. She stood under the street lamp, looking straight at me. I could see her face from where I stood. She was not smiling this time. I could feel hatred and pure anger emanating from her. The expression on her face was beyond menacing. It seemed as if she was ready to lunge at me and rip my heart out. Her eyes were dark and piercing. She knew what had transpired in my home a few minutes prior. This time I was afraid, deathly afraid. I turned around and ran home as fast as I could, looking back occasionally to make sure the woman wasn't following me. When I finally reached home, I locked the door and apologized to my mom for starting the fight earlier. I told her what I saw and she forgave me and helped me calm down. My frightening encounter happened in February of 2008. I have not seen the nun since, and frankly, I don't want to see her again. This experience has certainly turned my skepticism of the paranormal on its head. Prior to these last few experiences, I had never seen anything that I could not explain through logic. I certainly have a more open mind when it comes to the paranormal. I still wonder about the nun from time to time. Who is she? Why is she wandering the streets of a suburban town? How is she able to sense our emotions and reflect them back at us? I may never know. The other room. I was a person who never believed in the paranormal. I just assumed everyone who did was crazy or imagining things. Now I can say with great certainty that I was the person who never believed. I had been driving from Texas to Key West, Florida as a vacation and an adventure. I had just broken up with my girlfriend of several years and was looking for a change. So I got in my car, 
stopped to fill up with gas and headed to the highway. I decided to follow the coastline until I reached the end, Key West, Florida. At that point, I would be able to go no further unless I had a boat. So there I was. After many hours of driving, I decided it was getting late. The stripes in the road were all blurring together, almost as if they had become a single line and my bottom began to feel like lead was being injected into it. That was about the time I looked over and saw a sign from a motel that had a 24-hour diner a few miles up ahead. I pulled into the diner parking lot. When I got out, the smell of jasmine lingering in the air mixed with the dusky scent of the late night sea breeze brought fond memories of my childhood playing alone the Texas coast. The motel sat directly across from a bay whose shoreline just across the road was cluttered with debris. Not the kind from people, but the kind that nature sheds. Logs, limbs, dead leaves. I also noticed that a majority of the trees were cypress. You know, the kind that grow in the swamps with the large trunks. To me, this was creepy and beautiful all at the same time. And then add the large moon that seemed to hover just above them, almost as if it were helping to create some type of strange shadow, sinister, but not threatening. As I entered the diner, which was also the check-in lobby, I found myself to be very tired, so I quickly paid for my room. At that stage, I was really oblivious to the surroundings as all I wanted to do was shower and sleep. So I decided to head to my room, which was across a small gravel parking lot. No need to move my car and went into my room, which seemed quite clean and cute in a Southern way. And although very small, it seemed to have a wonderful Southern charm, so I had no problem falling asleep after a nice warm shower. I had set the air conditioning to medium as it only had three settings, low, medium, and high, and the night was very muggy and heavy with the moisture, so medium seemed to be a good setting. At last sleep, the bed itself was soft and hugged me. The pillow, though, felt rather flat, but it felt good to my road-weary head, and I could still hear the hum of the tires as they aimlessly rolled over asphalt. My eyes began to close, the steady sound of the running AC and the various vehicles whining as they traveled to and from some unknown destination. I fell into sleep. Several hours later, I woke. The room had this strange aura to it, almost like some neon light was shining through a window behind a tree branch and leaving ominous shadows fixated on the room walls. The air was now very cold and left me wanting to get up and turn down the air, but not wanting to leave the comfort of the warm blankets that I had surrounded myself with, I decided to stay put. Then I felt the bed depress. Someone had just sat next to me. What was this, a robber, a murderer? I became very frightened. Then I felt a hand from some empty space placed on my shoulder. I had been sleeping on my side, so whoever this visitor is, they were sitting behind me. I wanted to turn around to see who had come in to remove my things or possibly my life, and I found that I could not move. I tried to shout, but found myself unable to. It was as if something or someone had run a current of electricity and frozen all my muscles. Unable to move, I was in terror. Was this the end? Then she pressed her lips against my ear. I could feel the breath caressing my hair. And then she whispered these words to me. Emily, tell him to meet me in the other room. It was an unusual request as I am not Emily, nor am I female. So did my killer want something else? Did the one that came to burgle me decided that they wanted nothing more than to converse? It was at that moment that the room returned to normal. Although if the sweat that my body was covered in was an indicator, you would have thought that I had just returned from a sauna, not the blizzard I had just fared. Now able to move and talk, no longer cold, I got up and turned on the lights not seeing anyone in the room, nor did I find traces that anyone had been there. I checked the air conditioning, still on medium. I must have had some type of nightmare that was really vivid. 
I do not do drugs or drink, no mental disorders that I am aware of. So what happened? So now I've come to the realization that I was just dreaming and with my anxiety leaving, I am still tired. I see that it is two in the morning and I do have a long drive tomorrow. No one seems to have been in my room. I checked the only window, locked, no vents, door locked, no other way to access the room. Am I crazy? As I lay my head down and snuggled into the clean smell of fresh sheets, I returned to that place I refer to as breaking glass. You know, right before you enter the deep sleep, but barely sleep. Then came the dreams. Everything seemed to be in place, as if I were making a movie for some famous Hollywood director with an unlimited budget. It was all there. The cypress trees, warm breeze coming from the bay, horse-drawn buggies swiftly traveling down a freshly built dirt road with little puffs of dust rising gently behind as they passed. The sun felt warm and bright. There were ladies in beautiful flowing dresses walking past. The strings from their bonnets seemed to dance around their face as if music that only they could hear sang out to them. Gentlemen with capes and large hats stared out at the younger shirtless men, removing a variety of crates from a small boat, shouting out orders. I could only hear the voices as they chattered in an almost alien yet recognizable jargon. Mid-century American, I can only presume. This place was beautiful in all its visually stunning colors, smells, and sounds. Then I was pulled from this perfect place, ripped from something I can only refer to as Eden, and back to the freezing realm that I now refer to as my room, at least for this night. The entity that once terrified me decided to grace me once again with her presence. But now knowing that it was not a serial killer that wanted to dissect me, or some robber who wanted to relieve me of my belongings, I was not as frightened, still scared, but not the overwhelming terror from my previous visit. Then came the cold, that seemingly familiar arctic blast that would freeze me in time. The bed began to move as my new, not so invited guest sat behind me. The sweet feel of her lips, as she whispered those haunting yet riddling words, the all too familiar feel of that soft breath softly blowing in my ear. And again, she said, Emily, tell him to meet me in the other room. A sentence that will forever play in my mind as I wonder what the mystery meant. What was the connection to the past? Did she die by the hands of a jealous lover? Perhaps a fit of rage from some stranger she just met. Why was she here reaching out to the scared little man? I know she meant me no harm. I could feel it. This poor girl was stuck here in a loop like a broken video playing over and over throughout time. I now did not fear this lost soul, but wished I knew how to help her. I became overrun with sorrow for her and hatred for whoever caused this to happen to my new friend. Shortly after the second visit, and I had retained all of my mental facilities. It was already morning and time to get back on the road. I got dressed, packed my bags, and prepared to leave. But before I walked out, I turned to look once more, where my inner terror was dangled before me, and I could not help but to feel pity for this woman, trapped in this lonely room with only the occasional visitor to reach out to. A tear formed in my eye as I slowly closed the door. A sadness that I had not felt since the death of my father overwhelmed me. And in silence, I said goodbye. As I turned to leave, I felt what I can only describe as some kind of embrace, perhaps a thank you for the time spent together, or the understanding, maybe a please don't go. It was room number two at the Hunter's Lodge, somewhere in Southern Louisiana, about 20 years or more ago. I do remember when I got coffee that morning at the diner, I told a girl working there my story. She replied, Honey, this motel has been haunted by a female spirit as long as I can remember. And room two seems to be the worst. Had I known that, even as a non-believer, I would have gone to the next motel. I have since tried to find this motel, but to no luck, as I don't remember the name of the town and I cannot find any info on the Hunter's Lodge. And anyone knows, just make sure to ask for room number two if you dare. Whistling Dixie.
This is sort of a ghost story and sort of just a really creepy incident without a good explanation. Sometime during 1992, my father's company did a promotional campaign to celebrate opening new offices in Southern Georgia. They sent each employee a special greeting card featuring Southern images such as the Confederate flags, Civil War images, etc. The card read, now opening offices in the heart of Dixie. The card had a mechanism inside to allow it to play a tune when opened. This card was programmed to play a tune called, I Wish I Was in Dixie, or Dixie. If you are familiar with these types of cards, then you understand that they only play when opened. When opened, the left-hand side of the card pulls a tab on the right-hand side, which connects the battery to the speaker to play the tune. If the card is shut, the tab can't complete the connection, so the card can't play. No power, no tune. My little brother loved this card and claimed it as his own. So it was no surprise when the card was eventually forgotten about by the rest of the family. About a year after the card arrived in the house, we were all awake in the middle of the night by the sound of Dixie. It was very creepy to wake up to mysterious music and not know the source. My brother then remembered the card and we realized it was probably the cause of the music. We searched the house, but the music stopped before we could find the source. Off and on over a period of two to three months, the music led us on a search of the house. It played long enough to get our attention and get us out of bed looking for it, but not to locate it. The night we finally found the card, it was underneath the seat cushion of a wingback chair in the family room. It was playing loudly and closed as it played. It stopped playing when my mother picked it up. When she opened it, it would not play at all. It did not seem to be damaged, and there was no reason for it to play when closed. My mother put the card away in her desk drawer and still has it to this day. It has not played since that night. It was a curious and creepy event, especially since there was a bit of neighborhood controversy going on at the time. A development company had just purchased a large parcel of land nearby and planned to build a shopping center on it. The land at the time contained the ruins of the trenches and battlements built to fight the Union Army and keep them from entering Richmond. Maybe the spirits were upset by the construction as it destroyed the trenches and battlements they worked so hard to build. The Builder We lived in a very small town, you know. Everybody knows everybody and all their business kind of place. Well, one day my mom got a call from the post lady asking her if she would be at our house in a couple of days. My mom said, of course, and the post lady asked her if her uncle could come by and look at the house because he was the one who built it. Of course, mom was most obliged to do this. So a couple of nights went by and sure enough, the uncle showed up. He was very old, but very nice. Mom invited him in the house, but he saw that it was just her, me, my brother and sister there. And being a Southern gentleman decided it would be best if he just walked around the outside. My brother was 10, my sister was seven and I was four. Mom put on our shoes and we all walked around with him. He was particularly interested in the part of the house that was added on and stood there for just a while looking at it, I guess making sure that it met his approval. Mom could tell how interested he was in the add-on and asked him again if he was sure he didn't want to come in. The man said thank you, but no thanks. Not being rude, just polite. They talked for a while and then the man shook our hands and left. About two months later, the post lady told mom that her uncle had passed away a couple of nights ago from natural causes. Of course, mom offered her prayers to the family and made a casserole for the post lady's family. A couple of weeks later, mom, who was a very heavy sleeper, woke up in the middle of the night. She wasn't sure why. She went to the bathroom, got a drink of water, and sat in bed again. As soon as she crawled back into bed, she heard the screen door to the porch creak. Then she heard footsteps on the porch that went to the front door. The door opened and she heard somebody walking down the hallway. She listened to the footsteps as they were coming closer to her room. Then she saw a beam of light. At first, she thought it was somebody with a flashlight until she realized it was right in front of her bedroom door, which she always left open, and there was nobody holding that light. 
As it stood there, it started to take the shape of a man, but still not clearly. It was just clear enough that she could tell it was looking at her. It then pointed toward the part of the house that had been added on as if to say, I'm going to go in here for a little while. My mom nodded at the man, letting him know that it was fine with her if he looked around. It walked down the hall into that part that was added on and then mom heard the back door open and shut. She figured he had left. She got up to check. He was gone. As soon as he had pointed to let her know what he was doing, she knew it was the man who had come to look at the house before. He must have just really wanted to look at the inside, but did not want to intrude while he was alive. New Orleans Ghost First and foremost, let me say that I have never really been a believer in the supernatural. It's not that I don't think that there's more to life than what we can physically see. It's just that I've never really had a ghostly encounter. And I'm just like most ordinary people, going about my business, paying bills, trying to make ends meet and so forth. That was until Hurricane Katrina. I'm an MP in the Air Force Reserves in Texas. We were activated in August of 2005 at the behest of our governor to help the battered state of Louisiana. Part of our job was to patrol the streets of New Orleans with food, water, and what little medication we had left to offer the citizens of New Orleans. We were also there to offer transportation to those who wished to leave but were stuck without a means to travel. Contrary to what the mayor, Ray Nagin, stated on TV and radio, we were not there to harass black people. We were volunteers who were trying to help fellow Americans. That being said, I remember one evening we were patrolling near the Ninth Ward, not a very nice place even before the hurricane hit. My squad and I were walking in the middle of the street, yelling out that we were military police. We had food, water, and a way out if anyone needed assistance. I could see every house had been boarded up to keep looters out, and many people spray painted slogans on the front and sides of their homes, like, you loot, I shoot, and you loot, you die, were the ones that stuck out most in my mind. Slowly, some people did emerge from their homes and asked for water, food, and medicine. We gave them whatever we had and asked them if they needed to be evacuated. Many refused to leave their homes for fear of losing what little they had left. Anyway, I noticed that all the houses on this one particular block had been boarded up, save one. It was a typical southern plantation-style home which looked like it had been built around the time of the Civil War. A small figure of a little girl caught my eye as I looked up at the second floor. I smiled and waved at her mainly to let her know that I was there to help and that she had nothing to fear. She seemed to smile and wave back from what I could tell. I called out to her to get her mommy or daddy, but she just stood there staring at me. It was then that a kind of cold shiver ran up my spine. I really couldn't understand why. It was my cop sense kicking in. Two tours in Iraq and over 20 years as a sheriff's deputy had developed this, so when it went off, I paid attention. Just then, an elderly man on a bike rode up and asked if we could help evacuate his family of seven out of New Orleans. I told him we'd be happy to help him out, and I asked him if he knew anything about the little girl and her family living in the old plantation home. He looked at me kind of puzzled and asked, what girl? I turned around and pointed to the second floor window, but she was gone. I told him that I had just seen a little girl at the window and she waved at me. His eyes widened a little and he just smiled and said, So, you've seen her too, huh? He put his hand on my shoulder and said, Son, there ain't nobody living in that house for over 100 years. I started to protest. But he just shook his head, laughed, and walked away. He was leaving. I could have sworn I heard him say, some things about New Orleans are better left unsaid.